Tonight on the Donlin Report, we are following two breaking stories. First in Kenosha, drama outside and inside the courthouse. We're on the ground with the latest there. Also breaking, President Biden's vaccine mandate has been suspended. That word came down late today from OSHA after the latest legal victory for those fighting it. We're going to talk with one of the business owners who led that charge coming up in a minute. And did you hear this today? What is so hard about saying that this is wrong. This is not about me. This is not about Representative Gosar. But this is about what we are willing to accept. AOC's call to members of Congress asking what they're willing to accept after one of their own. Congressman Gosar tweeted a video depicting him killing AOC and attacking the president. The House voted to censure the Arizona congressman today and strip him of his committee assignments. We have that and a whole lot more to get to. Great to have you with us live from our Chicago studios. The Donlin Report starts right now. Good evening. If you're like us, your eyes are trained on that courthouse in Kenosha, Wisconsin. That is the pulse of America. There will be a third day of deliberations as just about half an hour ago, the judge sent the jury home and about two hours ago, the defense requested a mistrial, saying the prosecutors didn't give them all the video evidence they were supposed to. More on that in a minute. News Nation's Brian Enton will join us. But the defense move could be motivated by what's happening or maybe not happening inside that jury room. It's anyone's guess, of course. But as the hours tick by, you have to think that room is getting smaller and smaller. And an acquittal, according to some experts, less likely. We'll see. What about the scene outside the courthouse? You have to think the jurors can certainly see and hear what's going on. After all, they're not sequestered. So does public opinion start to cloud that debate in the jury room? Or maybe worse, fear of retribution from either side, depending on which verdict they reach. Today, a protester showed up wearing a rifle saying he's an anti-Black Lives Matter protester. So tensions already running high. And the media often criticized for fueling that division, which is something the judge addressed today. When I talked about um, problems with the media when this trial started, that's, we're there in part, not, not fully, but in part because of grossly irresponsible handling of what comes out of this trial. I'm going to think long and hard about uh, live television of a trial again next time. Something we like to say on this network, two things can be right at the same time. In this case, certainly a litmus test for that theory. If we learn anything from this trial so far, it's perhaps this. Regardless of your intentions, probably not a good idea to show up at a riot and run through the streets with an AR-15. David French, senior editor of The Dispatch and contributing writer at The Atlantic, put it this way. The movement to make a hero out of Kyle Rittenhouse is both ridiculous and dangerous. He was a foolish kid wielding a deadly weapon, but even foolish kids have a right of self-defense. Based on the evidence, acquittal is reasonable. Validation is not. There's a lot to go at tonight. We start, though, with News Nation's Brian Netton, as mentioned, on the ground in Kenosha. Brian, you've been there all day. What's the mood like there on the streets? Uh, people are anxious, Joe. Uh, they are nervous in this community, waiting to see what happens next. Many people were hoping for a verdict today. Uh, you mentioned it, 4.30 this afternoon, though. They decided they would stop deliberating today uh, and they would continue tomorrow. But I would say the most interesting part of the day uh, was this motion to dismiss. Uh, it all goes back to a November fifth incident five days into the trial that is when the prosecution gave the defense a copy of this drone video uh, and now the defense is saying wait a minute the drone video that you gave us was compressed and not as high quality as the version of the video that you have. The prosecution explained it in court today, basically saying, look, we couldn't airdrop you the video, so we emailed it to you. That's the reason it was compressed. This was not intentional. Uh, at the end of it all, the judge said he needed to talk to some experts to really understand what went on, whether it actually matters in the big picture of the trial, uh, and he has not ruled yet uh, on the motion to dismiss, Joe. So, Brian, uh, give us an idea of what it's like outside the courtroom. We can see some of the folks uh, milling around behind you. How many people would you say are there? And again, what's the mood like? 
Yeah, I'd say a couple hundred protesters outside the courthouse today, more than we've seen uh, since all of this started. But what was really interesting is going about a mile from here into the business district today. That was the area that burned and was destroyed last year during the riots. Talking to the business owners there today, many of them extremely nervous right now, on edge, on pins and needles. There was one woman who told me, look, I've got five kids to support. I lost my business last time. I couldn't put food on the table for my kids. I sympathize with the protesters, but please, please don't do that again. Keep things peaceful. Uh, you can imagine these business owners really nervous about what might happen next. Yeah, we can for sure, Brian. In fact, we talked with one of them who had his furniture store burned down last summer. So we'll continue to keep an eye on that. And again, the deliberations continue tomorrow. Brian Etten live for us tonight. Kenosha, thank you for the update. Joining me now for more, criminal and family lawyer Mark O'Mara. Mark, it's great to have you. So let's start with this new call for a mistrial because of the video that the defense claims the prosecution withheld. What do you make of this? I don't think it's going to turn out to be a mistrial. I, I think it was incidental. You have to show some really bad faith by the prosecution, and it's not there. The fact that it was compressed didn't really destroy the validity of it. So, you know, you have to put these motions out there, and sometimes they're cumulative. Sometimes the judge will get frustrated enough. There are a couple of motions pending for mistrial. This is not going to be one that I think should be granted. So what if there is a mistrial? Mark, this is where I'm confused, because as I at least understand it, some of these could allow the prosecution to refile, others wouldn't. What's the strategy here in trying to file these mistrials? Is it maybe a, sort of a Hail Mary or, or what is the strategy? Well, you know, defense always wants to get that information out to the judge, right? So if you have a motion for mistrial because of bad evidence or questionable evidence, you know, the judge may not grant it. But again, it can be part of the foundation for a motion that he might grant. As to the question of mistrials itself, generally speaking, a mistrial, which is just bad evidence got in or some witness said something they shouldn't have, like they talked about the defendant's right to remain silent, Generally speaking, that's a motion for mistrial. You come back the next month and try it again. There are a few cases, however, where if the defense can show prosecutorial misconduct, you did it out of bad intent, mm -hmm. then the judge can take the case away from the prosecution and say, you evidence such bad acts by this motion for this mistrial maneuver that I'm going to grant it and we, you will not try this case again. Mm. And that would mean that no matter what happens with this verdict, even after a conviction, the judge can pull it back and say it's a mistrial, Rittenhouse goes free. But if they are able to do this, refile the charges, Mark, what I'm not sure about is the defense seems like it has done very well in this case. The prosecution has made several stumbles. It's been criticized for the case they put on. Yeah. Why wouldn't the defense take a chance with where they are right now? You know what I mean? It, does the fact that the jury's still out give them some, some concern? A couple, of, a couple of answers. One, the defense does not want a mistrial. The defense wants a mistrial with prejudice. Okay. They want to not have to try this case again. I, if I was the defense and all I had was the option for a mistrial restart, no. They're in a much better position now than they will be next time because the prosecution learns right. a lot by this trial. Absolutely. So having said that, yes, they want to go forward. Yeah, so what do you think, Mark, is going on in that jury room right now? We still want to read the tea leaves. My hope is that they were going to give a couple of three days, and that's what they're doing because this verdict is being watched uh, by the country. Even though it's not a racial trial, so to speak, mm -hmm. it has those racial overtones because of what led up to it. But having said that, uh, my thought is that they're spending their time, they're going over the evidence. What we want the jurors to do is to bounce their ideas back and forth, right? If there are people, it could be six and six, it could be 10 and two, one way or the other. Right. We want them to deliberate. We want them to think it through. My gut, and, and this is pure guesswork, is that they are now considering lesser included offenses. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to come back with the most serious offenses on Rittenhouse because this self-defense is there. But so is the you shouldn't have been there as a 17 year old with a weapon of war. Um, so I think they're wrestling with what to do to send a message to Rittenhouse. So but also maybe to the rest of us as to whether or not 17 year olds should be wandering around with AR-15s. Right. Fascinating. I mean, it sounds to me, though, that you think if they're looking at the lesser included, that they're they're leaning more toward guilty. 
Well, and remember, if you had, let's just say you had eight people for first degree, you know, the, the more serious, and right. four people for acquittal, right? Now you can come in and go, well, okay, here's a compromise. And, and jurors often compromise. They compromise mm -hmm. on the number of counts. They let them go on some counts. Wow. They compromise on lesser included, and they may acquit them of some. So okay. I think that with this length of communication, they're talking a lot about it. Well, it's fascinating, and I can't wait to see where, and, and like all of us, where it all ends up. Marco Merritt, it's great to have you tonight. Thank you very much for the time. Great to be here. Up be next, well. uh, for us here, the agency charged with implementing and enforcing the president's vaccine mandate is halting its work now weeks in advance of the president's January 4th deadline. This came down late today. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, known as OSHA, says it remains confident in its authority, but following a series of lawsuits and a court order last week, it has now suspended activities related to the implementation and enforcement of that mandate pending future developments in litigations. Certainly a big development for Brandon Trosclair, who joins us again tonight. We talked with him uh, recently about this suit. He was part of it, a supermarket owner in Louisiana and Mississippi, again, a litigant in one of the lawsuits against this mandate. So Brandon, it's great to have you back. Give us an idea of what you thought today when you heard this. Thanks for having us again, Joe. Uh, man, what I thought is, I thought it was about time. You know, the, the courts ruled strongly twice on this, uh, on this mandate in our favor in the Fifth Circuit. And still, even after uh, the second ruling came down and put a stay on this, it took almost a week for the White House to finally backpedal on this and for OSHA to stop. So it's about time, uh, a jerk in the chain for the small business owners and the American workers. So I mean, we're very excited. You, you took on the federal government, Brandon, and, and you won. I mean, normally you have to wait for an appeal, but uh, at this point, it looks like OSHA has just pulled the plug and said, look, we're not gonna do this anymore, at least for now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It certainly looks that way. Um, and if it continues to go um, past the Fifth Circuit and they appeal, whatever case, and go to the Supreme Court, we're going to fight it all the way to the Supreme Court because uh, we know we're right and the Constitution backs us up. For people who didn't catch you the last time you were on the broadcast, Brandon, why did you decide to go ahead with this? Was this a matter of you not wanting to force your employees to get vaccinated or to have to deal with the fallout if you had to lose them? Yeah, so the, so the same answer as before. The federal government put me in the position to where I would have to terminate someone uh, if they didn't want to take this vaccine, and that's their personal medical choice, or put the burden on them that they would have to get vaccinated, I mean, get tested twice a week. Uh, that's not any of my business as their employer, and it's certainly not any of the business of the federal government as well. So what does this mean for your supermarkets in particular, Brandon, and I guess for other businesses? I mean, if it were me and you hadn't already instituted some sort of a mandate, I might just think I'm going to wait and see how this ends up in the end and wait till all these appeals and everything else get cleared up. Yeah. So for, for me, it's relief. It's relief that uh, we don't have to worry about uh, as of right now, these excessive fines. Uh, we don't have to worry about putting in policies and procedures to, to abide by this mandate. So it's a big relief. Uh, I've been getting uh, contacts from people all around the country and they're like, Hey, my employer is still making me do this. Why is that? And I would, I say at this point, it's just, you know, that's the discretion of the employer, um, you know, to, right. to do so. Yeah. Do you think this is over, Brandon? No, I don't think so. I don't think. Uh, They'll appeal, uh, right? Yeah, I think it will be appealed and I think we'll ultimately end up at the Supreme Court. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think the uh, Biden administration or the liberal agenda is going to give up that quick. All right, Brandon Trosclair, supermarket owner and litigant with the Liberty Justice Center against that federal vaccine mandate. A big development today. Great to have you last week. Great to have you back to explain it again today. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you. The Rittenhouse jury has been sent home for the night. They will return tomorrow. Plus, we are talking to our top prosecutor later this hour. He'll join us to break down the different personalities in this Rittenhouse trial and whether they've been portrayed fairly. But up next, AOC gives an impassioned speech ahead of a censure vote for Congressman Paul Gosar. He tweeted a violent video showing himself attacking AOC. Here's part of what happened today. What is so hard? What is so hard about saying that this is wrong? It is a sad day in which a member who leads a political party in the United States of America cannot bring themselves to say that issuing a depiction of murdering a member of Congress is wrong. That trickles down into violence in this country.
And that is where we must draw the line independent of party identity or belief. That, of course, New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on the House floor today calling out the actions of her fellow Congressman Paul Gosar. The Arizona Congressman retweeted a video last week that depicted him killing Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and attacking President Biden. Congressman Gosar addressed Ocasio-Cortez and the video on the House floor this afternoon. Here's a bit of that. I voluntarily took the cartoon down, not because it was itself a threat, but because some thought it was. Out of compassion for those who generally felt offense, I self-censored. I have said decisively, there is no threat in the cartoon. The House later voted to censure Congressman Gosar, stripping him from his committee assignments as well over that video. This is the first censure of a member since Democratic Congressman Charlie Rangel of New York back in 2010. Joining me now for more on this is entrepreneur and author of Woke Inc., Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek, it's great to have you. So Gosar says, this is not a threat. Seems to me like there's not a lot of nuance here. Are we missing something? Look, I, am I proud of what he said? I'm not. Do I like the quality and the state of our politics in this country right now? I don't. But I think that we got to be careful to draw a line between conduct that we don't like and don't want to see in our politics and conduct that actually merits being censured or stripped of your committee assignments. Because people who are voted to Congress aren't voted by their peers. They're voted by the citizens of this country who put people in office. And if those people don't perform or don't meet their tasks or responsibilities appropriately, then the right answer is to vote them out of office through free speech and public debate amongst the citizenry, not to have a small group that actually strips those people of responsibilities. Illegal conduct is another thing, but political discourse that fails to meet the high standards that I'd like to see for political discourse in this country, that's something that I would wish, but it's not necessarily something that merits actually stripping somebody of their committee assignments and depriving the results should, of a democratic vote. Should he have just been censured the then, office. you think? Look, I think that I think that a censure is really meaningless. I mean, I think that what do you think you're actually accomplishing by censuring somebody? I would have less of an objection to a pure censure without stripping him of his committee assignments if they're going to rebuke him and acknowledge that they didn't approve of what he said without stripping him of his committee assignments or having a democratic consequence. I think that would be a more acceptable outcome to me. Here's what Majority Leader Steny Hoyer had to say about it late this afternoon. Hang on. It is disgusting, Madam Speaker. Whenever someone out in the world tweets a threat of violence or hateful content, but when a member of the House does so, no matter how you rationalize it, no matter how you try to put lipstick on that pig, it is a threat of violence. Can't that appall you, even that act? Do you have no shame? Vivek, considering what members of Congress have been through, I mean, between January 6th and, and, and some of them getting shot at at a baseball practice, I would think this would be a no-brainer. Don't do it. Not a good idea. Look, I don't think they should be, I don't think they should be, I don't endorse what he said. Believe me, I think that the state of our political discourse in this country is in a poor place. This was just another symptom of it. But I also object a little bit to the high horse that many in Congress are riding today, the very Democrats who are condemning him, who did not say a word to condemn actual violence across this country for much of last summer. Where were they in condemning actual violence in Kenosha? By the way, a, topical of, a topic of relevance even today as we await the verdict of the Rittenhouse trial. So I think that each side is able to wear the mantle of moral authority when it's convenient. But actually what we really need in this country is stand-up politicians who recognize that whether you're in Congress or whether you're an everyday citizen, to denounce violence or the threats of violence as a bad thing, but not to exaggerate it and use it as a threat to achieve things that you want to achieve politically that you couldn't achieve through the front door, like stripping a politician you don't like of his committee assignments, even though he was democratically elected. All right, I Vivek, think I'd like to see us move beyond the hypocrisy on both sides. All right, you mentioned the Rittenhouse trial. That's really why we wanted to have you on. We got some bonus uh, answers from you on the AOC situation today, but your tweet got a lot of attention on the trial, pointing out that the judge had to tell the jury to ignore statements made by the president about the defendant. You said that says a lot about where we are as a country right now. What do you mean by that? Where are we right now? Look, I think the courtroom ought to be a place that we adjudicate fact and law full stop. I think the executive branch and the legislative branch ought to stay out of it. Instead, we had a president of the United States who has himself 
communicated his views on this defendant, calling him a white supremacist. We have a powerful member of Congress, Hakeem Jeffries, who has actually said that he wants to see Rittenhouse locked up and someone throw away the key. We have social media companies who regularly act in concert with government today, censoring any posts saying that Rittenhouse was innocent, even as they allow posts to continue saying he was guilty. GoFundMe, a leading platform that cut off fundraising for his legal defense. That affects justice and the delivery of justice in this country. I think this was in part a politically motivated prosecution, but the conditions that create the political rewards for that prosecutor come from the president of the United States and come from other institutions in this country. And I think it really shows how far we've come that the last line of defense, the actual courtroom, the judge and the jury are the final line of defense to somebody who ultimately stands to get a fair trial. And I also think it's shameful that the president of the United States, who otherwise should stand for the rule of law, should stand for the presumption of innocence, instead jumps into what is a contentious trial with his irresponsible words. That's what I was calling out. All right, we will see. Uh, Vivek uh, Rabaswamy, it's great to have you. I know we've been trying to connect on your schedule for a long time. Thanks for the time, and we appreciate you dropping by. Thanks for having me. Now this. And so if you're going to be scared or concerned, um, about what uh, Donald Trump or anybody else might call you um, during the race. You're probably not fit to be president anyway. That was former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie interviewed by News Nation's own Dan Abrams discussing 2024 candidates and possibly running against former President Donald Trump. You can catch that full interview at Dan Abrams Live right here, News Nation, 8 Eastern, 7 Central. Now to the border. Border Patrol lists more than 164,000 encounters last month. That's down from some of the summer months. The Biden administration saying one thing, but perhaps doing another when it comes now to keeping the, uh, migrants in Mexico as their process. We're going to get an update on that next. Plus, parents protest on Capitol Hill. They say they don't need the government as a co-parent. Was their message heard? One of those parents joins us coming up as well. Parents are being pushed out. Government wants to take over more and more of what used to be considered private life. The man known as the QAnon shaman will spend at least the next three and a half years behind bars. Jacob Chansley was sentenced today in federal court for his role in the January 6th insurrection. The Horn guy, you know him. At the nation's capital, pictures of Chansley went viral after he appeared shirtless, wearing face uh, paint and also the horns there while he led others through the capital, shouting into a bullhorn. Federal prosecutors asked for a long sentence so his case could be used as an example. Chansley previously agreed to pay $2,000 in restitution and asked the court to sentence him to time served so he could be released from jail immediately. The controversial remain in Mexico policy now also known as migrant protection protocols, which requires migrants to wait south of the border during their immigration proceedings, may be making a comeback. According to court documents filed this week by the Department of Justice, the DHS is ready to re-implement the program once Mexico decides to accept the return of these migrants. A uh, sharp contrast to the memo DHS Secretary Mayorkas sent out a couple of weeks ago, stating the Biden administration's intent to repeal the Remain in Mexico policy. The administration has since been publicly quiet about that policy. Joining me now for more on this, Daily Caller reporter Jorge Ventura. He spent a lot of time reporting on the border, and we tap into his knowledge every now and then. Uh, the last time we heard from the administration, Jorge, they were planning to repeal this. Why do you think they've changed it now? Well, I think, Joe, if you just look at the numbers, um, they're still uh, at alarming high rate when it comes to border crossing. So, I mean, if you just look at October of this year and compare it to the October of last year, we still are seeing a 128 percent surge in illegal crossings. Uh, Rio Grande Valley in Texas has still has seen a 161 um, percent increase rate in their illegal crossings. And the Del Rio sector in, in Texas has seen an increased rate of 236 percent. So for October, we had over 160 apprehensions. Now, that might be a third month low. But let me remind right. folks that in July and August, we, it was the first time in Border Patrol history we had back to back months with over 200 thousand apprehensions. So right. according to the DOJ, they say that Mexico is set to uh, follow that remaining, uh, remaining Mexico policy in the next coming weeks. Jorge, is in your experience and the sources you talked with and, and what you've seen down there, does this policy work? Because several we've had on the broadcast say it's what we should do right away to try to stem the number of these encounters. But when President Trump implemented this, we looked it up in January of 2019, 
the number of encounters actually went up significantly, and that's the last time we talk about a spike in these encounters, which was after this Remain in Mexico policy had been put in place. So when I speak to Border Patrol and sources on the ground, they absolutely support the Remain in Mexico, the, the Remain in Mexico policy because it does deter the illegal um, migration. So when, I, when I'm speaking to Border Patrol, and the reason they say is if you're a migrant, uh, the risk of coming to the United States isn't worth it when the Remain in Mexico policy is instilled because for them, you know, why would they pay the cartel and human smuggling groups to come all the way to make this dangerous journey to only be told to remain in Mexico in one of these dangerous border towns? So when I speak to Border Patrol, they say they actually like this policy. Um, before that, before the Remain in Mexico policy was reinstated, when they used to let these migrants um, release them into the United States with a court order, Border Patrol tells me that only 13% of the time those migrants even come back. So right. they, they support the Remain in Mexico policy if it isn't reinstated. I, I am absolutely sure that we'll see a curb in this illegal migration, especially when these, these high uh, number of apprehension numbers are definitely going to see a decrease if this policy is reinstated according to the if DOJ. It is, yeah. I, Jorge, we want to get you on the Rittenhouse trial because you were in Kenosha last summer when this all went down. And my question for you is, has this trial, in your opinion, been an accurate representation of what you saw go down last summer? Um, it is. It's, it was, you know, to me, it was a complete war zone being on the ground. Um, I covered the riots um, in every major city last summer, but Kenosha was by far the worst. There was a lack of law enforcement, lack of National Guard uh, on the ground. And like I said before, it, it did feel like you were in the war zone. Um, I do believe that the Rittenhouse shooting could have been completely avoided if, if law enforcement came in and actually stopped the riot. So let me remind the audience that the Rittenhouse shooting happened on the third night of riots. So this could have been stopped on the first night. This could have been stopped on the second. But it's been a, uh, it's been a complete war zone. And the thing that's been back in my mind is if this jury with, with a, with a trial that's so politicized if this jury has already made up their mind even before the case has started. Mm. Well, we'll find out probably soon. Jorge, it's great to have you again. Thanks. We'll be in touch, especially as this verdict uh, comes down. Appreciate the time. I want to continue the conversation now about the Rittenhouse trial with former federal and state prosecutor and our friend Pat Brady. Pat, uh, your assessment as to where this jury is right now, what do you think Read the tea leaves. We all say this. The longer they're out, you think what? If they, if they believed Rittenhouse, would they have been back already? Yeah, oh yeah. If they believed his testimony, it's all about Rittenhouse and the reasonableness of his beliefs at the time he fired the shots. If they believed him, this thing would be over. That would have been a perfect self-defense. They didn't even have to go further down the jury instructions or further so, deliberate. So, so where do you think they are then? Well, okay, they've been out two days, so but roughly, what, 16 hours of deliberation. Any other courtroom in the country that I've been in, in the criminal realm, this case should have been decided, I think, more quickly. The, 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 this being out for two days and leaving today at 430 in, indicates to me, and this is just trying to read tea leaves, they're, they're battling. They're having trouble, yeah. you think. And a couple things. You watch the, the closing and the evidence. This really was, to me, a, a jump ball um, in a lot of respects, but armchair quarterbacking this, I don't know why they just didn't charge the first one as a straight up the murder. Rosenbaum the shooting. Rosenbaum shooting charged it as straight up murder, much more clear cut than the second one where he gets hit on the head with a skateboard and then shoots. And you can make arguments on both sides. But if you just try that, it's a three day trial, a much better case. And it probably would be decided by now. But I think the second shooting is really complicating things. Mm. All right. Let's listen to something that the judge had said today about this process. And Pat, you and I have talked about how unusual so many elements and unconventional uh, yeah. So many elements of this trial have been. Here's, here's part of what the judge said today about this idea of letting the defendant pull the juror numbers for the final pool. I've had an almost universal policy of having the defendant do the picks. Well, it had nothing to do with anybody's race or anything like that. And uh, I never had a complaint about it before. In fact, I haven't had a complaint about it here. Um, but uh, some people seem to be dissatisfied with that. And uh, people who want to undermine... The result of the trial. So, Pat, this is a big national case, and the spotlight is on Kenosha, Wisconsin. Yeah. Criticism against the judge, criticism against the prosecution. There have been some against the defense. Warranted, in your opinion, or is this a reflection of how the judicial system works across the country? I firmly believe we have the best judicial system in the world. But any system like this is made up of human beings who are imperfect. So I think what you're seeing today in this trial the last couple of weeks is much more representative of the criminal justice system and generally 
in general than you might see out of the Southern District of New York or the Central District right. of Los Angeles. Big city. Big city. So you can go around the country, and, you're, and I said the other day, other day, there are a lot of goofball judges. Some of them are really goofy. <laughs> this is guys who want them. But to me, the only thing that really matters is, is he properly applying the law, and is he being fair to both sides? Now, to your question about grabbing the, the balls out there by the defense to make it, he's like bending over backwards to a, appear fair to the defense. But the reality is, the prosecution's in trial, entitled to a fair trial, too. There are victims here that are entitled sure. to a fair trial. It seems to me that if he's making a mistake, he's leaning too far to the defense. All right. We'll see if we get a verdict tomorrow. Yeah. I, I may be hung. Hope so. May be hung. I That's just hope another, everybody stays calm. Another possibility. Yeah. Pat, good to see you. Thanks. Republican lawmakers say a whistleblower has come forward claiming the Biden administration has used the Patriot Act, a law to stop terrorists, to investigate parents. Attorney General Merrick Garland denied such suggestions in a hearing last month. I can't imagine any circumstance in which the Patriot Act would be used in the circumstances uh, of parents complaining about their children, nor can I imagine a circumstance where they would be labeled as domestic terrorism. Meantime, parents rallied yesterday in the shadow of the U.S. Capitol just blocks from the Department of Justice calling for more parental say in their kids' schooling. One of those parents was Maude Marin, and she joins us live now. So, Maude, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. You called this rally, government is not a co-parent. What do you mean by that? Well, I think it's been really clear over the last, you know, over 20 months that parents are going to need to um, join together and are going to need to speak up in order to get our kids back into school, real school, where parents can go into the school, where we can see what's going on with our kids and where our kids can be unmasked and talking to each other at lunch. Um, and parents are going to really need to work together be, to defend parents' role in education. Do you feel like you've lost that? Is it because of the pandemic? Or, I mean, it seems to me like parents have always had the ability through a PTA or some other school board meeting or other ways to express what they want to see happen in their local district. COVID has been a really convenient excuse to cut parents out of education. I'm here in New York City, and we're the largest school district in the nation, close to a million students. Um, and I haven't been inside my kid's school um, since before March of 2020 for a PTA meeting, and, um, and, and most parents haven't. You know, we haven't, I have a, a kindergartner. Normally you go in and you see what they're learning and you get to, to read your kid a, a book on their, on their birthday. None of that is happening because parents are kept outside. And it's at a moment where parents have increasing concerns about what's going on inside the schools. Yeah, I thought most schools were back, though, Maude. I don't know. I mean, my kids are grown. I, I haven't been as close to it as I would if I had small kids, which brings up the whole issue of the vaccine mandate and what happens with that. What was your message with this rally, Maude? What do you want to see happen more? Our message was really clear. It's that we are the parents and we get to make the final decisions about what's going on in our kids' lives. And when it comes to education, that means when parents say, we don't think books with pornography belong in the school library. You have to listen to parents. When parents say, we want to talk about what kind of curriculum is being introduced, we don't want kids to be divided by race, even if you're calling it an affinity group instead of segregation. You have to listen to parents when we talk to you about that, because we're talking about the well-being of our children. All right, Maude Marin, parent, attorney, and member of yesterday's parent rally in Washington, D.C. Thanks for coming by. We appreciate the time. Thanks so much. Russia, to put it mildly, has gone rogue, including a missile test that blew up a satellite. Chaos in space and prompting the Pentagon to warn of a modern day Star Wars. That's coming up next. And a major tennis star disappears and other stars want to know what happened. She tweeted that she'd been sexually abused by a government official two weeks ago and hasn't been heard from since. That's ahead. Looks like space has a little extra junk thanks to Russia, and U.S. officials are not happy about it. Russia fired a missile at one of its own satellites as a test, and it created thousands of pieces of debris, sending International Space Station astronauts scrambling to take cover. Some 1,500 objects of debris that are now threatening the space station. Here's some audio from the ISS the moment they were told to take safe haven in the Dragon capsule. The information we have right now indicates that we will need to activate Dragon Safe Haven 
and close center line hatches for the next two crossings. All right, station copies that the next time of closest approach is 0706 and that we intend to activate Safe Haven and Dragon. Man, they always sound so calm despite what's happening, and that uh, was reason to maybe be worried. Here to talk more about this, former Naval Intelligence Officer and member of the Hoover Institute, our friend John Jordan. So, John, what did you make of this when you heard about it? Well, the Russians have long been pursuing an anti-satellite uh, capability and technology. In fact, something they've worked on and been refining really since the 1980s. The idea being to have a military application to degrade America's communication uh, capabilities, uh, perhaps with GPS and as well as uh, re most importantly, probably reconnaissance and surveillance satellites. But uh, for the Russians to do this and make, uh, make a big show of it, this uh, get world headlines is not a coincidence. Um, Recent Russian actions in the Ukraine, um, actions by uh, Belarus, Alexander uh, uh, Lukash Lukashenko in right. Belarus on the Polish border, all of these are connected. All right, I I'm just kind of curious how this goes down, John. I mean, does Russia alert anyone and say, hey, we're about to touch off a missile here and blow up a satellite? I mean, this, this must have set off alarms at the Pentagon, didn't it? Yeah, it must have. Uh, there's various protocols, international conventions with regard to space activity, both bilateral ones between us and uh, other spacefaring nations, as well as international treaties. Um, and it's not clear that they were observed or even necessary in this case. But in any event, you're quite right. It did set off some alarm bells. Well, here's actually what the, the Secretary of Defense said about this today, and he, he addressed it at a news conference. Let's listen. Well, there's a debris field there now that'll be there for forever, and uh, it uh, it's a it's a safety uh, concern, and uh, and so we would call upon Russia to to act uh, more responsibly. Certainly, uh, we we are concerned about the weaponization of space, and uh, we would certainly uh, call upon Russia and all countries to act in a responsible uh, manner. Couple things to unpack there, John, uh, but let's start with what he talked about there with the weaponizing of space. What do we make of that? Well, yeah, this is the actual uh, deployment and use and subsequent detonation of a weapon in space. And as he points out, that de debris will be up there for some time until its orbit decays enough where it re enters the Earth's atmosphere. Right. And there's already a proliferation of space junk anyway that threatens capsules as well as the space station. Yeah, there's a lot up there floating around. And as he said, it's not like this goes anywhere. It's just flying around now in space. Let's get you, John, on uh, Russia and uh, once again amassing troops at the Ukrainian border. Didn't we just go through this? Yes, we did. We went through this in April. Um, but the difference is this time, the Russian, when the Russians were, did this in April, they actually left behind a lot of heavy equipment, tanks, self-propelled art artillery, surface-to-air missiles, and the like. Um, both along the Russian border and in the disputed uh, territory of, of Ukraine, of Crimea. So the Russians actually left a lot of their hardware behind and then they're able to bring troops in. And the, the concern for NATO and a lot of other countries is that this shortens the amount of uh, warning time that any country that Ukraine or the West would have should Russia mm. as, uh, take tensions up and perhaps engage in a military incursion. So it is risky, but the Russians, this is part, think of the, I speak Russian and I'm a pretty, well, pretty familiar with how they think. And the best way to understand this is the Russian national pastime of chess. And what Putin's, the game is being played here is one of, of position. Um, they want to raise the stakes along Ukraine. Um, they want to test the United States. They want to test a Ukrainian public opinion and make the Ukra Ukraine um, and probably some of the Baltic states feel isolated from the West and make them uh, believe that Russia can do whatever they want right. um, so that Russia continues to grow its influence in the region. All right. John Jordan, a former naval intelligence officer, thanks for the time, John. Appreciate it. On Balance with Leland Vittert starts at the top of the hour. Man, it seems like just yesterday you were uh, in Austria for that. Yeah, getting, yeah, with, uh, with, with, with Putin. Summit. Yeah, right. with Putin and uh, How far Biden, away for sure. we are. Okay, let's get you on this story that caught our attention today, and a lot of people are talking about with this missing Chinese tennis star. What's going on? Missing Chinese tennis star. There have been new emails which have surfaced on Chinese state media in which this woman is recanted her sexual assault allegations against the vice premier of China. So this was a guy who was a member of the Politburo, and Sheng Peng has accused him on the social media site 
a Weibo, which is the Chinese version of Twitter, of sexual assault. That was early November. 30 minutes later, the tweet or the Weibo thing disappeared, and she's disappeared too, held incommunicado. Now you have these emails uh, that Chinese state media have put out, which uh, if you believe them, uh, I have bridge to sell you as well. They're you, just making a statement about it, right? No, no, they put out emails that are allegedly from her. To, to him? She, no, to the head of the Women's Tennis Association. Oh, okay. Saying... He's, she's fine. It, 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 look, Chinese propaganda. But the bottom line is, is you have a woman who's accused a high-ranking Chinese official of sexual assault, very famous woman, and she has been mm -hmm. disappeared. Right. Which is kind of par for the course with the Chinese. Look, they did it with Jack Ma, the head of Alibaba, when his britches got a little too big for uh, Xi Jinping. But the important question for me here is, where's LeBron James? Where's Kim Kardashian? Where's all of these other athletes calling out the Chinese government and saying, wait a second, you can't do this to people? They're nowhere. Well, the ten a lot of tennis players have. That's true. Sure. Yeah. Uh, all right. Top of the hour on balance. Leland Vitter, we'll see you then. Thank see you. See you then. Uh, hero jogger saved the day, and it's all caught on video from the Ring doorbell camera. How the jogger saved pets from a burning home. That's ahead. Get ready to say goodbye to the Staples Center, at least the name anyway. The Los Angeles home of the Lakers, Clippers, and Kings set to get a new name, and it's a reflection of the times we're living in. It'll soon be known as the Crypto.com Arena, the new name scheduled to take effect Christmas Day. Cryptocurrency platform Crypto.com paid $700 million for 20 years in what's believed to be the largest naming rights deal in history. We can tell you how much that is in Bitcoin, but that would require math, and I was told there wouldn't be any math. Here's another one that we call the American Snapshot, and it certainly is just that. California gas prices making headlines again. Parts of Southern California saw a surge in prices, climbing to $4.67 on Monday. That's just 10 cents away from the record of $4.70. Man, it sure seems like I've seen prices even higher than that. Either way, California's numbers have soared above the national average of $3.41 per gallon this week. That's according to AAA. Experts aren't sure how high these prices will go at the pump, but uh, it'll certainly keep squeezing people who hope for a more normal holiday season of road trips to family gatherings and also heading to the store to maybe buy presents for the holidays. A lot of people Fewer are heading over the hills and through the woods to grandmother's house for Thanksgiving, that's for sure, and gas prices aren't helping. But that is our American Snapshot tonight, and that's our time. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night. On Balance with Leland Vitter comes your way next. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.